Welcome to the final talk of the Discovering Our Dignity series. We have saved the best for last, the Blessed Mother. You'll find an outline of this talk in Lesson 22, along with room for notes and discussion questions. Do you ever wake up and feel so knotted up inside that you dread the day ahead? We can feel this way for all sorts of reasons, too much to do in too little time, unresolved relationship conflicts that drain us of our joy, worries over money, guilt over past mistakes, illnesses that sap our hope. Wouldn't it be great if God would untie those knots in our hearts so that we could face each day with enthusiasm and a spring in our step? We can learn from the example of Mary. Her obedience untied the knot that keeps us from true freedom, and that freedom is available to us today. That's why for me, prayer time in the morning is essential. I need God to take my jumble of thoughts and emotions and fears and smooth it all out. Each morning when I wake up, I meditate on the following verse during my prayer time. For freedom, Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery, Galatians 5.1. Christ set us free from the consequences of sin by his death on the cross. He offers us a way to get right with God and have a fresh start. Many of us have experienced being set free in this way, but we still feel tied in knots. Yet what did Christ set us free for? Freedom. This freedom referred to in Galatians 5.1 is a day-to-day -day freedom available to his beloved children. Jesus said in John 10.10, I have come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Is that the life that we are experiencing? Even though I have experienced the freedom that comes from Christ's death on the cross, there are all sorts of things that can imprison me throughout the day. The crazy thing is that I knowingly walk into the chains and willingly place my hands in the shackles. What things can bind me? All too often I choose the slavery of perfectionism, the slavery of equating my worth with performance, the slavery of expectations, mine and others. Freedom is one of the most precious gifts available to us as beloved daughters of God. When God gave us choice, free will, He was giving us the freedom to choose what would set us free or choose what would keep us in chains. Defeated, burned out, ashamed, fearful, depressed, in bondage, addicted. No woman wants to use those words to describe her life. We prefer to be described as confident, stable, joyous, peaceful, radiant, free. Our culture offers its solution, its protection to ensure our freedom. And we are told things like, every woman should have control over her own body. Reproductive freedom is a basic right. Every person has the right to choose. It would be unfair to restrict a woman's choice by prohibiting abortion. The solution proposed to ensure our freedom is our right to choose what to do with our bodies and when. We remain in control. We decide. Listen with compassion to these voices of women who choose this solution when they experience unwanted pregnancy. Not only was the precious life within me being destroyed, but also my own sense of worth, my spirit of love and goodness and dignity given to me when I was being formed in my own mother's womb. It was replaced by a deep inner self-hatred that no one but I myself could ever know. The torment that wrenched my inner being was probably as close to hell as I could ever get. I've had three first trimester abortions. I came to have them because abortion was available and legal. It was the easy way out. I was 17 years old on my first, 18 on my second, 19 on my third. I went alone all three times and never let the fathers know. The first one I had in Boston. I felt like they were treating us like cattle. There were so many of us having it done. I was very rushed. The other two I had in New Hampshire, and they were a little more personable, yet still deceiving. It affected me by sending me two signals. Since it was legal, I thought it was acceptable. I thought society was accepting this, when in fact it still isn't talked about casually. I was very depressed, and I turned to drugs, then became very callous, bitter, and cynical. Suicide crossed my mind occasionally. I had a free pregnancy test at a clinic. They asked me if I wanted the baby. I said my husband was out of work and I couldn't afford one. They scheduled an abortion. They never offered an alternative. 
Scary, I read the chart and realized that I was further along than they had told me. It took two suctions. I began screaming. They told me to shut up. I cried day and night for three months. I couldn't live with my husband anymore. I divorced him and left my kids. I didn't deserve them since I had killed my baby. What have I done to deal with my abortion? Nothing. Terrible. I murdered my baby. I am nothing. I am no good. Are these the voices of women walking in freedom? Many of them may move on from this place and experience healing, but it's clear that they would say the freedom of choice that they were offered ended up feeling more like bondage. Many would describe their hearts as tied in knots with no idea of how to release the tension and pain. Many women look back and recognize that they were lied to. This is just one example among many of ways in which we get confused about how we can experience freedom. God didn't intend for freedom to be confusing. He intended for it to be our greatest gift from Him, the means by which we could willingly choose Him and enter into the most satisfying love relationship imaginable. But as, Lance, but as Nancy Lee DeMoss wrote in her book, Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free, the best lies are those that look most like truth. So what happened? Something stole our freedom. What was it? To understand where our true freedom went, we need to return to the Garden of Eden. As we sit in the Garden of Eden with Eve, we can ask her and ourselves, what tempts us to make the wrong choice? What tempts us to believe the lie? The answer for all of us will be the same. We think we'll get more. Eve thought that if she made the choice to disobey God, she'd get more knowledge. A woman who makes the choice to have an abortion thinks she'll get more freedom and opportunity. When I make the choice to be enslaved by perfectionism, performance, and expectations, I think I'll get more accomplishments and accolades. In all three cases, we're believing a lie. It's a lie as old as time, and the author of the lie is the same. Just as the serpent promised Eve more if she would make the choice to do things her way, he promises us more if we ignore God and do things our way. It started with Eve. She was free to be all that any woman could ever wish. But what did she choose to become? She chose to put her will above God's will. And when Eve made her choice, she ushered in what stole our freedom, sin disobedience to God. What was the consequence? She was alienated from God. Since then, we've all been distanced from Him. Her sin broke the most important of all relationships, the vertical one with our Creator. But the relational damage didn't stop there. There was alienation between Adam and Eve, then between man and nature. Suddenly, there were weeds in the garden, a shortage of water, stifling heat. Paradise was gone. All might have seemed hopeless, but God in His mercy gave Eve one tiny ray of hope. We call that ray of hope the Proto-Evangelium. The early church fathers saw the Proto-Evangelium as the first gospel, the first promise in scripture of a redeemer. In the words of Pope Benedict, at the very moment of the fall, the promise also begins. In this passage of the Bible, God explains the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice to sin. He speaks to Adam, Eve, and the serpent. In God's words to the serpent, he mentions a woman, a very important woman. We read this first gospel in Genesis 3, verse 15. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. The offspring of this chosen woman would bring blessing and liberation. He would strike the serpent's head while the serpent would strike his heel. The Jews throughout Old Testament history knew and were counting on this promise. The prophets had foretold a coming miracle and the people waited. Who saw this promise fulfilled? Not Sarah, not Leah, not Abigail, not Esther, not Deborah, not Ruth. Thousands of years passed. Each young Jewish girl wondered if she'd be the one to give birth to the Messiah. It's said that there was a heightened spirit of expectancy at the time of Christ's birth, a sense that something was going to happen. God's eyes had roamed over all the people he created throughout history, and they settled on Mary, a young Jewish girl. 
She was to be chosen. She was to be the new Eve. All men and women were tied up in the knots of their disobedience, but freedom was coming. It hinged on a young woman's choice. Mary didn't have to say yes. She had free will. God sent an angel to deliver the message to see what she would say. What would she choose? We don't know what form Gabriel appeared in to Mary, but this is how he was described in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 through 17, when he appeared to Daniel. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen, whose loins were belted with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the noise of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and when I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was speechless. And behold, one in the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, and I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision pains have come upon me, and have retained no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. What must Mary have felt when out of the blue this creature appeared to her? Remember that her mind hadn't been desensitized by all the special effects that we see in movies. She had never in her life seen anything like this before. The description of the angel Gabriel and Daniel's reaction explains the words spoken to Mary by Gabriel. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. What was being proposed to Mary was terrifying. It was a complete upset of her plans. It would mean the loss of her reputation. She would be misunderstood. She wasn't given complete explanations of how it was all going to go. What would she choose? Would she choose to do things her way, remaining in control? Or would she trust God, step into the unknown, and say yes? Father John Bartunek writes in his book, The Better Part, her life turned upon an invitation. The angel came as a courier of the king, but still she needed to say yes. God would not force her to play so great a role in his plan. Her heart needed to be willing. She would need her heart through all that followed. It required remarkable courage, and all hell broke loose as well. Her enemy raged. She nearly lost her marriage. She and Joseph certainly lost their standing in the synagogue. Mary needed a steadfastness of heart to keep saying yes after the angel first came. And Mary said yes. Why was she able to do this? She believed with all her heart that nothing is impossible for God. She chose to obey and she showed us by her example how we can live in freedom. The Catechism describes it this way. The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the Virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Mary found freedom through obedience. Her faith was evidenced by her trust in and obedience to God. He led her through the darkness. She didn't know what the future would hold, but had the dim light of faith to take one step at a time. She stayed so close to God that she could keep her eyes on Him and be led through circumstances that were confusing and heartbreaking. Even when she didn't understand, she determined to cling to God's hand, trusting that He would get her through. In the book, Mary, the Church at the Source, Pope Benedict writes, full of grace therefore means once again that Mary is a wholly open human being, one who has opened herself entirely, 
one who has placed herself in God's hands boldly, limitlessly, and without fear for her own fate. It means that she lives wholly by and in relation to God. She is a listener and a prayer whose mind and soul are alive to the manifold ways in which the living God quietly calls to her. She is one who prays and stretches forth wholly to meet God. She is therefore a lover who has the breadth and magnanimity of true love, but who has also its unerring powers of discernment and its readiness to suffer. You may be thinking, well, it was easy for her. Mary was without sin, so of course she was open to God. Of course she placed herself in God's hands boldly and without holding anything back. Of course she wasn't worried about her own fate. I'd do that too if I didn't have any sin in me. We need to remember that although tradition teaches us that Mary didn't sin, she still could have chosen at any point to do things her own way. Years ago, when our oldest four children were eight, six, and four, and two, we headed to the pool to cool off in the afternoon. The oldest three kids were able to swim, but our two-year-old hadn't learned yet. We were all walking like ducks in a row, me at the front, the children walking behind, and our babysitter bringing up the rear. All of a sudden, I heard our babysitter scream our two-year-old's name, and I turned and saw that when we were walking by the adult lap pool on our way to the kiddie pool, he had fallen in and was sinking. Immediately, I jumped in and pulled him up. I had saved him. But isn't it true that there are two ways to save someone from drowning? Curtis Martin says it well. You can pull them out of the water or you can keep them from ever falling into it in the first place. Jesus saves us by pulling us out of the water of sin. He saved Mary by protecting her from ever falling in at all. The church teaches that Mary was freed from original sin and its consequences, but that simply placed her in the same position as Eve. Before the fall, Eve had been free from original sin too, but that didn't prevent Eve from choosing to do things her own way. God had given her free will, and she had always had the choice to sin or not. It was the same for Mary. Her choices weren't easy. Because she was without sin, the way that she loved was pure. It was unmarred by self-interest. This means that when she chose to accompany Jesus to the cross, it was even harder than we can imagine because her love for her son was perfect and she felt things even more acutely than we do. She lived with an astute sensitivity, perfect in compassion, perfect in purity, deeply feeling others' pains with perfect empathy. As Pope Benedict said, she is therefore a lover who has the breadth and magnanimity of true love, but who has also its unerring powers of discernment and its readiness to suffer. Her choices weren't easy, and neither are ours. Each one of us bears the awesome responsibility of choice. It's a part of what it means to be created in God's image. We have free will, so we can choose for him or against him. We can choose to let him work through us, placing us wherever he thinks it's best, or we can choose our own comfort, our own reputations, our own convenience instead. The choice is ours. God will not force his will on us. And our choices, just like Mary's and Eve's, have consequences. The consequences of Eve's choice was sin entering the world. The consequence of Mary's choice was the Redeemer entering the world. What will be the consequence of your current choices? When we choose to obey God, the path may be hard, but we will experience freedom. When we choose our own way, it may seem that the path will be easier, but there will be consequences, and they won't only be felt by us, they'll be felt by those we love most. I'm challenged by St. Paul's words in Galatians 5.13, for you were called for freedom, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another in love. Serving one another means making a choice to put self aside. And this is true freedom. This is one of the many paradoxes that Christianity is full of. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The last will be first. Obedience is the path to freedom. This is not a one-time event. This walk of obedience is a daily battle. There is no shortcut. It's always the way of the cross. 
But it's only as we obey that we will experience the freedom that God promises. But what about people whose freedom is taken away from them against their will? How can obedience, doing things God's way, help in those cases? How do we explain this teaching in light of a Jewish man in a concentration camp during the Holocaust? What are the times that our freedom is taken away by someone else's sin? These are good thought-provoking questions. It brings my mind to the writings of Viktor Frankl, a World War II concentration camp survivor. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offered sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And there were always choices to make. Every day, every hour offered the opportunity to make a decision, a decision which determined whether you would or would not to submit to those powers which threatened to rob you of your very self, your inner freedom, which determined whether or not you would become the plaything of circumstance, renouncing freedom and dignity to become molded into the form of the typical inmate. Seen from this point of view, the mental reactions of the inmates of a concentration camp must seem more to us than the mere expression of certain physical and sociological conditions. Even though conditions such as lack of sleep, insufficient food, and various mental stress may suggest that the inmates were bound to react in certain ways, in the final analysis, it becomes clear that the sort of person the prisoner became was the result of an inner decision and not the result of camp influences alone. Fundamentally, therefore, any man can, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him, mentally and spiritually. He may retain his human dignity, even in a concentration camp. Dostoevsky said once, there is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. These words frequently came to my mind after I became acquainted with those martyrs whose behavior in camp, whose suffering and death bore witness to the fact that the last inner freedom cannot be lost. It can be said that they were worthy of their sufferings. The way they bore their sufferings was a genuine inner achievement. It is this spiritual freedom, which cannot be taken away, that makes life meaningful and purposeful. Not only does Satan long to keep us in bondage, many people sadly delight in doing the work for him. Countless people experience injustice and suffering at the hands of others. Because of this, many of us go through life full of wounds and wonder if freedom will always be beyond our reach. What does the obedience that brings freedom look like in these cases? The first steps of obedience remain the same, regardless of our circumstances. It's a choice to trust God. That was the core issue for Eve, for Mary, for an emotionally wounded person, and for someone who hasn't suffered that much. We all need to choose to trust God, regardless of whether we understand what he's up to. And when we make the choice to trust, he starts to work his miracles. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. I'm going to start reading with verse 3 in the RSV version, verse 4 in the NAB. Hang with me and the application will be made clear in a minute. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none belonging to them shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came forth out of Egypt. So in a nutshell, these verses are telling us that God cared about his people so much that there were consequences to the 10th generation for the Ammonites and Moabites because they didn't help the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. God remembered. And the passage goes on to say, and because they hired against you, Balaam the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you, Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, and this next part is key. But the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loved you. Someone sitting here today needs to hear that truth. The Lord your God loves you. 
if you are going through a trial, if your past has left wounds on your heart, if you're weary, you have got to know that you are loved. The Old Testament lexicon aid of the Keyword Study Bible defines love in this way. It's the word ahab in Hebrew. It implies an ardent and vehement inclination of the mind and a tenderness of affection at the same time. This isn't some airy fairy theoretical love. This is a love with strength. This is a love that shows a lot of feeling. I can best imagine it when I think of my own love as a mother. Have I ever felt a vehement inclination because of my love for my child? Absolutely. I can remember my daughter's fifth birthday party like it was yesterday. She had been in four schools in four years and I so wanted things to go better for her socially. It had really been rough and girls can be really, really mean. We remember it ourselves, but when it's our little girls that are being hurt, it's so much worse than we experienced it ourselves. Don't you think? So I would planned what I thought was the best birthday party imaginable. I thought it would be such a help. All the girls were coming and I was so pleased until I found out that one of the girls, the queen bee of the mix, had invited every girl coming to the party to a sleepover at her house right after my daughter's party. Everyone, that is, except for my daughter. Did I ever feel a vehement inclination toward that girl? I wanted to pull her hair out. You can hurt me if you want, but don't you touch my child. Can you relate? This is the kind of vehemence that stirs in the heart of God when one of his children is touched. This vehement inclination is combined with a tenderness of affection towards us, all rolled together, and we are loved by a God who will fight for us, who will die for us. Your freedom may have been taken away from you, and you may have felt powerless to do anything about it. Dear friend, know this, God sees, God cares, God loves you, and he is in the business of turning what was meant to curse you into blessing. The Lord your God turns the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. The very circumstance that the enemy intended to put you in chains, to tie you in knots, to render you useless, God will redeem. He'll not only free you from it, he will make good come from it. He will turn it into blessing. He offers you freedom, but that freedom is tied to obedience. What is he asking you to do? Is he asking you to forgive? Is he asking you to let go of bitterness? Is he asking you to let go of being right? Whatever it is, no matter how hard, it is worth the freedom that will come. Where has God put you? What is he asking you to do? What choice is before you? Are you at the end of your rope? Have you decided that you are tired of being enslaved by old habits? Are you ready to have your knots untied and to experience true freedom in Christ? Let's learn and put into practice this important lesson from Mary. In the words of Father John Bartunek, we can learn no greater lesson than how to say yes to God. Mary's yes reversed Eve's no and paved the way for Christ's undoing of Adam's fall. Likewise, when God disrupts our lives through the voice of conscience, the normal responsibilities and demands of our state in life, or the indications of church teaching, our yes can echo Mary's and make more room for Christ in this fallen world. But our no, or even our maybe, can just as easily shut it out. Just as Mary's life pivoted on an invitation, on a choice, so does ours. Two paths are set before us. One way, often the harder way, is filled with the choices that God wants us to make. The other, often the easier way, will tie our heart in knots and leave us feeling defeated. Let's lift our eyes to heaven and remember the big picture. Let's be women of strength who are willing to endure the hard things so that we can become more like Christ and spend eternity with him. Will you pray with me, please? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 
Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of your mother, for the fact that she mothers us, she tends to us, she cares for us, she intercedes for us. And she's also gone before us as such a tremendous example of what it means to be feminine and fierce at the same time. I pray you would infuse us with courage and bravery so that we can say yes to you and not count the cost. That, there, that our hearts would be filled with trust in you so that we would know and believe that even if the path that we are choosing, because it's the path that you are pointing us to is the harder one, that that is the path that will bring blessing. May we learn and live out the truth that freedom comes through obedience. May we reflect you and reflect your mother into our hurting world. May we be transformed and changed because of all these weeks of studying women who have gone before us. May we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit working in each one of us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.